Hello guys, so today we will be discussing the solutions to the J advanced paper one. Now the paper, the code I'm solving here is code one. Now the first question, the increasing order of atomic radii of the following group 13 elements. Now the, the main point about the group 13 elements is when we're going down from aluminum to gallium because of the poor shielding of D orbitals, there is a unexpected result in the atomic radii and the ionization energy. So if you take the values of the radii for aluminium, gallium, indium and thallium. So for aluminium, the atomic radii is 143 picometers. For gallium, it is around 135, 136 and indium is 167 and it is 170. So we can clearly see that the smaller one is or smallest one is gallium. So answer is gallium, then aluminium, indium, thallium. So answer is B. Now the next question among NiCO4, NiCl4, right? so we have been given some compounds here, some coordination compound and this peroxide and superoxide. So we have to find out how many number of paramagnetic compounds are here. So first thing, if you talk about the NiCO4, it is having a tetrahedral structure that is sp3 hybridization zero unpaired electrons so this is diamagnetic okay because of the strong field ligand carbon monoxide there is a complete pairing so we don't get a unpaired electrons so it is diamagnetic then we have nicl4 two negative now it is again tetrahedral that is sp3 it has two unpaired electrons so it is paramagnetic then coming to the tetraamine now this case it is octahedral sp3 d2 or you can say d2 sp3 because inner orbitals will be involved so this will also be because of the strong field ligand ammonia they will be pairing so we don't add zero unpaired electrons it is again diamagnetic then moving on to Na3COF6. Now fluoride F negative is a weak field ligand. Structure is octahedral and here we have four unpaired electrons. So it should be sp3d2. Okay, not the inner d orbitals won't be utilized. So four unpaired electrons, it is paramagnetic then we talk about Na2O2. Now it is a peroxide O2 2 negative. We all know according to the molecular orbital theory, the O2 has two unpaired electrons. So if you get O2 2 negative, two extra electrons are added. So both single electrons get paired up. So it is zero unpaired electrons. It is diamagnetic. Then we talk about the cesium superoxide. Now we know that O2 1 negative superoxide. Now in O2, we need two more electrons to pair up. Now this has got only one extra electron. So it will have one unpaired electron that makes it para. So how many paramagnetic we have? Three. Okay, so answer will be B. Our next question, uh, complete hydrogenation, the natural rubber produces. Now. Keep in mind that the natural rubber and gutta percha, they both produce same compound on complete hydrogenation. So now this is our natural rubber or poly cis isoprene. Now when you carry out the complete hydrogenation, this is the final product. Okay, so it can be called poly 2 methyl butane or poly isopentane and according to the options given here. Isopentane, we can also call it ethylene propylene copolymer because this part you can say that it is coming from the ethylene and this part is coming from the propylene so basically we have a propylene part one ethylene part again coming together to form this product okay so instead of calling it polyisopentane or poly 2 methyl butane we can also call it ethylene propylene copolymer okay so the answer is first option a Okay, now coming to the next question. Now here P is the probability of finding the 1s electron of hydrogen atom. Now since they have 
return one s electron so it is the ground state of hydrogen atom in a spherical shell of infinitesimal thickness dr at a distance r from the nucleus now the volume of the shell is given as 4 pi r squared dr and we have to find out the qualitative sketch that is how the probability value varies with distance from the nucleus okay now it's a very good question now to start with we have to consider that ground state of hydrogen atom means that your wave function doesn't depend on angle because it's spherical we are talking about s orbital it is spherical so the angle dependence is out of question here second thing the radial probability distribution function is the probability of finding the electron in a spherical shell of distance i mean at a distance r and thickness dr from the nucleus and for this ground state gs is ground state the radial probability distribution function takes this form now we are talking about only this one part here okay this probability density generally you write it as psi square okay here we are denoting it by rho so it doesn't matter so this is the probability density this rho only so when you talk about the probability density the graph that you have is something like this okay only talking about the probability density not talking about the radial probability distribution function now this probability density when it is compared with the radius or with the distance it is maximum at the nucleus and falls off exponentially there is exponential fall with the distance from the nucleus but we are not talking about the probability density we are talking about radial probability distribution function now this distribution function doesn't show such a dependence because it's not only dependent on probability density but also dependent on this term 4 pi r square dr so as your r value approaches 0 this 4 pi r square dr also approaches 0 so the whole function this value approaches 0 so it cannot be maximum at the nucleus okay so in this diagram you can see now this is our shell from the nucleus at a distance r and having a thickness infinitesimally small thickness dr now in this particular diagram let it be a and this b you can see the probability density falls off exponentially as the r increases but when you talk about the radial probability distribution function it actually increases to some extent because here we also have a term r square so the fall exponential fall will be there but it won't be very quick it will be at a later stage okay at a particular distance like a uh, hundred at the r value hundred picometer you can see here we have a larger value so it does fall off exponentially but rather slowly okay so this is the only part that we have to consider that rho 4 into 4 pi r square dr so this first goes to the maximum value then comes down now there's another term to be considered here now this value rho 4 pi r square dr it's actually a volume element but you cannot compare it with rho into dv okay suppose i say you that i have a cube of uh, dimension dx dy and dz so this dv is actually dx into dy into dz now you cannot say that both these functions will give you similar graphs because here i have a fixed volume element but in this case this dr thickness is fixed but this r can be varied as the r increases the volume element also increases so it grows with the growing value of r but here we have a fixed volume element so you cannot compare these two also okay that's the important point in this part okay now coming to the next question 23 we have a one mole of ideal gas at 300 kelvin in thermal contact with the surroundings and it expands isothermally from 1 liter to 2 liter against a constant pressure of 3 atm so we have ideal gas here we provide some heat so it expands and the temperature remains constant and the external pressure is also constant 
Now you know that in a reversible process, the external and the internal pressures are infinitesimally close to each other. Okay, so when you are expanding against a constant external pressure, now this part only confirms that it's an irreversible process. So we have a case of irreversible isothermal expansion of ideal gas. Now, once we have identified the process, we have we are going from state A to state P, the pressure volume are changing, but the temperature is constant. Now, from the formula, you know, the from, from the derivation, the delta S of the system, not surrounding system is NR natural log V2 by V1. But when we have to calculate the delta S of the surroundings, we take the heat change in the system and take a negative mark of that because if five joules has been absorbed by the system, it must have come from the surrounding. So the surrounding must have lost five joules. So the Q surrounding is just negative of Q system. Okay, you can also write it as Q surrounding by T. So Q surrounding is just the negative of Q system. And according to the first law of thermodynamics, okay, we have delta U is equal to Q plus W. So isothermal conditions, delta U zero, so Q is negative of work done and work done in irreversible process is P external into V2 minus V1. Okay, so in this case, we have our Q system. So we put this value. Okay, sorry, uh, work done is actually work done is minus P external V2 minus V1. So Q system is negative of work done. So it goes plus and in the Q delta surrounding we have to take negative of Q system. Okay, so negative of Q system is again minus of P external V2 minus V1 divided by temperature and using this factor of conversion because one liter ATM is given to be 101.3 joules, we get to the answer that is minus 1.013 joule per Kelvin. So the whole point in this question was to identify it's an irreversible isothermal expansion and simply after that you can use the formula.